so highly developed that even small changes in the amount of water that, that falls are beginning to cause large implications for society's availability of water. Multiplying the impact of consumption and habitat destruction is the fact that, with fuels, with pesticides and herbicides and industrial chemicals, with noise and with electromagnetic waves and with human activity and with structures of control and domination, empire is literally and metaphorically poisoning every square inch of the planet. Yes, life will recover from what we are doing to the planet, but don't hold your breath. It's going to take millions of years. It's going to take an incredible number of human generations. Trillions of people will live in a biologically impoverished world if we don't stop our human impacts now. I spoke with Daniel Quinn about this mass extinction. He gave me a metaphor that has haunted me since. We are like people who live in a very tall building, brick building. We live on the top floor. And every day we go out, go down to the lower floors, and at random we knock bricks out and take them upstairs to the top and build higher. Every day, downstairs, 200 bricks, take them upstairs. And the building is perfectly stable. But it's not going to be stable forever because we are attacking the structural integrity of the building. 200 species a day, day after day after day, year after year. And as our population increases, it's going to turn into 400 species a day, 1,000 species a day. And there's going to come a day when the system is going to collapse. 200 species a day. This is, is calamitous. We may already be well over 200 bricks each day, and it looks to me like the building is not far from collapse. Everything in me wants to run out of the building before it comes crashing down around my ears. But where would I run? Empire now covers the planet. The building is everywhere, and almost all of us are inside of it. All of us. All six and a half billion of us. One of the hardest things to talk about is the human population explosion. The friends and neighbors I spoke with all seem to agree that the enormous increase in human population would soon have to be reckoned with. We're approaching full tilt, I think, in terms of what the planet can um, sustain. This, any species that has outgrown its environment is pressed for resources. Is, there, is it just all going to end and is that going to be the solution? You know, are we going to blow, are we going to become extinct like the dinosaurs? Equilibrium will be uh, re-achieved. Unfortunately, nature is a harsh taskmaster. Because we're so intelligent, because we're such a different class of animal with such a big brain, we have the ability to understand and foresee and prepare and stuff for these things. It doesn't mean we will. How will we face into the issue of human population? I went to speak with William Catton, a professor of sociology and human ecology at Washington State University, now retired, and author of an amazing book on ecology and human population called Overshoot. According to Catton's assessment of the carrying capacity of the planet, I think the way we're living now, the world was overpopulated already by the time of our Civil War. The population at the time of the U.S. Civil War was just over one billion. So we've now overshot that number by more than five billion, as Catton told me. It is possible to exceed carrying capacity, but only temporarily. If you exceed carrying capacity, you then damage the environment upon which you're depending. Looking closely, I've come to see that population numbers for humans, in and of themselves, are only part of the story. As Catton points out, it's the damage those numbers do that counts, and that damage is intimately connected to our way of life. The Earth supports as great a collective mass of ants as it does people. It can do so because ants aren't building 6,000 square foot homes, driving two hours to their jobs, buying plasma TV sets, and killing each other with depleted uranium munitions. 
we in the developed world have 32 times the footprint on the on the planet on the resources depletion 32 times the person in India uh, well we I think we all know that though the figure is stunning and it ought to make us really think um, and start to talk with each other about this you talk about how many uh, energy slaves per capita do we have uh, in this country, we've got something like 70 times as many energy slaves per capita as people in Bangladesh. Instead of thinking of that Bangladesh as the overpopulated country, if you multiply each of us by 70, take that 290 million or whatever number of us there are now, multiply it by 70, wow, we are an overpopulated country. In those terms, the U.S. is a nation of 21 billion people and my own three children add 210 to that number. To speak of population then as the root cause of our problem makes little sense to me. It conjures images of crowded third world cities and teeming masses of human flesh, while the global impacts of rich first world lifestyles go unexamined. Big feet, more and more feet, and more and more feet getting bigger and bigger. And if these feet just keep on walking, one of these days, they're going to walk right into oblivion. It cannot be sustained for much longer. There are any number of catastrophic forces that could lower our numbers as oil depletion, climate change, and environmental collapses play out. One thing large populations are especially prone to is disease. Microbes are going to have a lot more to do with it than humans have to do with it in the end. In, in nature, and we're still under governed by natural rules, we don't like to think we're not, but we are. And when you put together the kind of biomass that humans represent on this planet, we're an asset to somebody, we're a resource. But it may be possible to meet the situation with consciousness and intention. Once we get to the peak human population, wherever that is, I hope it is eight and a half billion rather than 12 billion, but it's going to be high. Whenever we get there, what? Do we have a vision of what we should do? I mean, we got to the peak and, and there's trouble all around us. What should we do? Somehow we've got to devise a way for a, obtaining a soft landing as we reduce the population from six plus billion down toward one billion. If we decide we want to reduce it, we can see to it that the reduction occurs in a more humane way than it will occur if we just try to keep on business as usual. Humanity has never been in this. This is new. This is new. And this is big. And this is not being talked about. And because it is not being talked about, we have no clear idea how we might devise that softer landing. Talking about it then, clearly and honestly, is the first step. Without that, catastrophe is inevitable but either way our global population is going to be reduced this is what I had to face the population of my species is going to be reduced I had to face it just like the grizzly bears have had to face it and the wild salmon have had to face it just like the right whales and the piping plovers and the mountain gorillas have had to face it just like the great auks and the golden toads and the black fin ciscos had to face it before they went extinct. And I had to face something else. I have a choice about how I meet it. My friend Lyle gave it some perspective. The fact is that there have been die-offs of civilization. There have been collapses of great, mighty civilizations. Sophisticated, powerful, unbelievable civilizations have, have collapsed. And uh, it's a choice. It's a choice that, that we can decide to succeed or fail and I'm gonna go ahead and decide to succeed, thank you. And I'd really like it if you'd come with me. <laughs> what choices do we now have? What would that success Lyle speaks of look like? What is inevitable at this point? And what remains to be created if only we awaken to our power? Most importantly, why have we not already awakened? And you know something? The more you talk about your problems, the easier they are to solve. It's uh, bottling things up inside this bad. We can't survive apart from, from the Earth. And so 
we're killing it. I think part of looking at things exactly the way they are is feeling how isolated and alienated we have become from ourselves, from the people around us, and from the natural world. And when you look at that and experience that, the natural response is deep grief. Deep grief at the loss of connection. There are other issues we could have looked at. How do we face into all of this information? It looks as though our very survival as a species is now in question. As I gaze unflinchingly at the world situation, the information goes right into my body. I feel shaken to the core. I feel like running away. I feel, at times, like I've been hit head on. I know I'm not alone. I wish I had some magic potion. I wish I had some easy fix. I wish I could just tell you that everything is going to be okay. But of course, I can't tell you that. And probably, deep down, you already know that. What chance do I really have, Doctor? Mr. Marshall, I have no desire to mislead you. I'm sure you realize that recovery is not a sure thing. 36 years after the first Earth Day, 44 years after Silent Spring, the planet is closer now to ecological meltdown than it has ever been. If what we want is to stop the destruction of the life of this planet, then what we have been doing has not been working. We will have to do something else. When we stay focused on the question, what do we do? We don't ask the more basic questions about how did we get here and if we don't ask those questions uh, I don't think we've got much chance of affecting the kind of radical change that we're going to have to affect if we're going to make it. Well I, I appreciate your being so frank with me Dr. Swanson. I guess I don't have to tell you how I feel from my experience, talking about how we feel is exactly what we need to be doing, and we'll also need to question some assumptions. One assumption I question is the one that tells us that since scientists can help us understand the situation, they are automatically equipped to tell us how to solve it. But there are forces at work in the world that cannot be understood through a microscope. What are the forces that brought us to this point? And what are the forces that keep us stuck here? I went to speak with the people who are trying to answer these questions. I realized that I would have to step outside of the culture so that I could see it from a new perspective. Deep inside the tangle of problems that threatens the entire world, there rages a boundless blaze of cultural fire, the locomotive power for the cultural train we're all now riding. An engine not of steam or diesel, but of story and myth, habit and belief. An engine racing out of control. It's time to look more closely at the culture of empire. So how did we get into this mess? Wow. That's a cosmic question. Many analysts think it started about 10,000 years ago when humans began to engage in a new and fundamentally unsustainable style of food production. What we invented was something that I call totalitarian agriculture, which is predicated on the notion that it all belongs to us. We can kill off anything we don't want on the land, put a fence around the land, we can grow the food we want on the land, and nobody else can touch it. That slippery slope that we're on right now, we started walking on that 10,000 years ago. And it is because of an inherent problem in agriculture. Agriculture really depends on disturbance. There's no way you can do agriculture without doing that catastrophic damage. So it makes agriculture fundamentally unsustainable. 